Hello, I'm Thomas Germano, and if you join me in the first half of this Sistine Chapel presentation, I talked about Michelangelo's work on the ceiling that took place from 1508 to 1512. In this second part, I'd like to talk about the altarpiece. Michelangelo came back 24 years later after an absence from Rome, and he returns 24 years later and paints from 1536 to 1541, The Last Judgment. And The Last Judgment was very aptly chosen for the altar of the Pope's private chapel because of all of the historical events that had transpired from Michelangelo's first visit to the Sistine Chapel. And when he left, so many historical events would transform Rome and would ch transform Christianity forever. And Michelangelo painted perhaps the greatest piece of propaganda, the last judgment of souls in the afterlife. So again, join me inside the Sistine Chapel as I take you on a virtual tour into Michelangelo's second great masterpiece known as the last judgment within the Sistine Chapel. So off we go. So here we are once again inside the Pope's private chapel, still used today as it was designed in the 15th century to be used as the balloting and election place for all future popes. It's been over 500 years that this is the place where all the cardinals assemble and they do not leave these premises until they decide upon the next pope to be elected by means of balloting. There's a lot of canvassing for votes and a lot of negotiations and uh, uh, talks amongst the cardinals, but they are not allowed to leave these premises. And for that reason, you cannot look out any windows. So there's no outside interference. The outside world cannot see what the cardinals are doing, nor can the cardinals see what the outside world is doing because the windows are so tall. Now, on the far end of the Sistine Chapel, uh, the place where we talked about Michelangelo finishing his work in 1512 in part one of this presentation, this is the altarpiece directly over the altar where the Pope celebrates Mass. And this is where Michelangelo would paint one of his great masterpieces in fresco, just as the ceiling was done in fresco, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ to pass judgment over the living and the dead. From a distance, before we move in a little bit closer, I want you to squint and look at that entire composition. And Michelangelo intended that as a death skull. Two eyes, a nose, and the mouth that stares at us from across the room. And it's a reminder of vanitas, that all will die and all must have an investment in where they're going in the afterlife. And that's the essence of the last judgment. Christ comes back to judge all of the souls living and dead. There's the day of rapture. Bodies are coming out of their tombs, out of the earth. Uh, those who are living go right to the judgment. And those who have been dead for many years are coming out of their tombs, some in different states of decomposition, but all are judged before the judge, Jesus Christ, who appears right there, which I allocated as the nose of the skull of death. Okay, as we move in a little bit closer, so you can see this and make things out uh, much clearer, the skull is the compositional device that Michelangelo unifies the entire composition with. There's a very bright blue background, which represents a sky, but then the arrangement of the figures conforms to the eyes, nose, and mouth of a human skull. In the upper tier, there are Christian souls who wrestle with the passions of Jesus Christ as they are considering what Jesus did for dying for mankind's souls. 
and we see them at the very top over here and over here as they represent souls who are struggling with the column that Jesus Christ was tied to before his crucifixion when he was flayed. And here they have the cross and the crown of thorns on the top. Okay, so we'll back off a little bit uh, so we can see this from a distance and look at some of the details, but we need to step back a little bit. Okay, so once again, coming back at it from a little bit further away, uh, those are the Christian souls at the very top, Jesus in the center, and his mother, Mary, who shudders underneath that raised right arm of Christ who has come in judgment. We then see the helpful angels who help some of these dead bodies out of their tombs and out of the ground on the day of rapture. They're lifting them up because they have no more flesh on their bodies, and they're being brought before the judge, Jesus Christ. This team of angels are blowing the trumpet to wake the dead. And as they come up on the right hand of Christ, left side of the composition, they come before the judge. And then those who pass judgment stay in heaven. Those who fail the judgment go down into the fiery furnace of hell. And overseeing that boat that rows people across the river Styx is Charon, and Charon has the oar as he's beating those damn souls off of his boat as they want a round trip ticket. But he tells them, no, no, nobody comes back. I'm just taking you one way. And off they go into that lower right hand corner with the fires of hell burning in the background. And this guy, who we'll talk about in a moment, who represents Midas with the donkey ears wrapped with snakes that gnaw at his genitalia, and just to the left of him are demons who are pulling these damn souls off the boat as they're in hell for permanent residence. Up closest to Jesus in the realms of heaven, and they're there to stay, are all of the martyred saints. And we recognize some of the saints by their attributes, including Saint Peter, the bearded figure here, who has the keys of St. Peter's. We also recognize St. Bartholomew, who holds his flayed skin, St. Lawrence, who holds the grill, which he was cooked alive on, and over here, St. Catherine and St. Sebastian, and rounding things off, St. Andrew. So those are the saints who died for their beliefs in Christianity, who are permanent residents of heaven at this point. Down below, we see horrors untold, as these are the demonic creatures uh, who are inviting these new inhabitants into eternal torture and damnation. Uh, so we see them all down below. When the Pope enters into the chapel, he comes right through one of these two doors on the either side of the altar. As tourists, we come through this door, and the Pope would exit through this door in his celebration of the masses. And this is the last character that he would see. As the legend goes, Michelangelo had a score to settle with the Pope's Chamberlain. And he wasn't too happy with this guy who was criticizing Michelangelo's use of nudity throughout the sculpture, throughout the uh, painting. The nudity was later covered over by Michelangelo's collaborator, Daniele da Volterra, only after the death of Michelangelo, and Michelangelo never lived to see the loincloths painted over the genitalia of his heavenly bodies. So that was a later addition, but the Chamberlain was given Michel Michelangelo such a hard time that Michelangelo found the perfect place for him, a representation of King Midas, who is legendary for having very poor judgment, donkey ears, and he's covered up by a serpent who's gnawing at his genitalia. So Michelangelo had the last word in that matter. And that's the Chamberlain of the Pope just over the door. When he petitioned to the Pope, who was the Farnese Pope who commissioned Michelangelo in 1536 to 41, when this was being done, uh, the Pope responded, my domain is not in hell, but only over the living here on earth. So it stayed, and that is Michelangelo's settling the score with a, an early critic. 
Now, there are a number of details here that appear in drawings before the painting was ever set to fresco. And there are some wonderful drawn figures, uh, but it is a little bit different than what Michelangelo had planned in the covers uh, that make them what was seen after the Council of Trent of 1564 decent for the Pope's private chapel. As I mentioned earlier, Michelangelo returned to a very different and transformed Rome in 1536. After he finished the ceiling, he left. Julius II died shortly thereafter in the winter of 1513, and Michelangelo got back to Florence to work on a long overdue project, the tombs for the two co-rulers of Florence who had passed away in the 1470s and 1490s, Giuliano and Lorenzo de' Medici in the new sacristy of San Lorenzo. Michelangelo designed the effigy for the Medici brothers. He designed the room in San Lorenzo, and he also proposed an elaborate facade for the church of San Lorenzo. That would never come to be, but the new sacristy took up a lot of Michelangelo's time in Florence. When he returns to Rome to paint the Last Judgment, Rome had seen the worst of its history in the past thousand years. Rome had been sacked by Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and it was sacked in 1527 to teach the Pope a lesson not to question the Holy Roman Emperor's power and his control over most of Europe. It was also under attack theologically and spiritually by the great uh, schism that was initiated first by Martin Luther in uh, the teens when Luther nailed 95 theses to the doors of a German cathedral. Uh, the Pope at the time, who was the Medici Pope, Leo X, he sent an army to arrest and kill, if necessary, Martin Luther. And Luther became the founder of the Protestant Reformation, but that had also transpired between the time of Michelangelo's finishing the ceiling and the time of painting the greatest piece of propaganda, the judgment over all souls. And if that's not enough, there was also the separation of the English church when Henry VIII was not allowed a divorce to his wife, Catherine of Aragon, who he married after his brother's death, Catherine of Aragon, uh, he was no longer interested in Catherine. The Pope said no divorces under any circumstances. So Henry decided to separate from the church and started the new Church of England, which we call the Episcopalian Church here in the US, but it's the Church of England in England, the beginning of a terrible period in the Catholic faith of the Reformation, the uh, period of uh, separation and adding insult to injury, the sacking of the city uh, by a secular ruler, Charles V. So painting this judgment scene, it's the Pope's message that all will be judged after this life. And whatever you do, you will pay for your sins in this world in the next world. So Michelangelo painting for the Farnese Pope at this point is playing the ultimate uh, card and is explaining what happens in the judgment, judging all of the enemies of the church, but also keeping the Christian soul on the straight and narrow path. This, as I mentioned, is the greatest piece of church propaganda ever created. Michelangelo's great masterpiece, The Last Judgment, from 1536 to 1541. Thank you for joining me in these two parts of the Sistine Chapel, and I hope to see you again for the next lecture.